everyone, and welcome to Maine Public Health Association's 2020 Annual Conference. This is Heather Drake, MPHA's Membership Manager, and I'm excited to be joined this morning by Elaine O'Connor and Kelly Bowden. Um, I will introduce them momentarily, but a few announcements before we begin. Um, if you need access to closed captioning, we're now providing that, and you can find that in the left-hand menu of the conference website to get the link specific for today's sessions. Um, we also ask that you please complete the session evaluation. You can find that um, in the same place where you access the live streaming. That's important for us, our speakers, and is required if you are seeking any continuing, uh, continuing education credit. So please make sure that you complete that. We will send out an overall conference evaluation at the end of the conference, um, but we do need you to do one for each session as well. And if you've forgotten to do any for prior sessions, you can go back and complete them. Uh, we will take questions throughout today's presentation, uh, and we'll have a Q&A at the end, so please use the ask feature to type in any questions that you have for Kelly uh, or Elaine. But with that, I think those are all the announcements, so I would love to introduce Kelly Bowden, who is a perinatal outreach educator with Maine Medical Center, and Elaine O'Connor, who is the medical director of the Maine Mom Initiative for both the state of Maine and Maine Health, where Excited to have you both here this morning and really thank you for your presentation. So I'll let you take it over. Perfect. Well, thanks for having us. I'm going to start. Um, next slide, Kelly, please. Um, we have no disclosures, nothing to declare. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to briefly start just talking a little bit about um, substance use during pregnancy, just to contextualize a little bit about sort of what um, we work on. I'm going to talk mostly about the pregnancy side of things and then hand it over to Kelly to talk about the baby. Um, I'm just going to sort of give some high level um, information as well, just so I think folks better understand um, what women with substance use disorders encounter during pregnancy. So just a quick review of what is addiction. You have these slides, you can read that. So I think the really important thing to take note is that it's a chronic disease that's absolutely treatable, um, not a choice, not a decision anyone makes, um, but something that very much can be treated. We really try to treat our patients with respect. Um, you know, patients with substance use disorders encounter tremendous stigma. And I would say that there's no group more stigmatized than pregnant women with substance use disorder. Um, so really important to use proper language, proper terminology, um, try to use the term substance use disorder if you can, as opposed to abuse. Um, and we're definitely trying to avoid words like addict or junkie. The other piece is we're really moving to call um, the infant substance exposed as opposed to drug affected, um, in large part because um, it often became drug addicted babies. And of course, babies um, cannot be addicted. Um, so we're really trying to use substance exposed. Next slide, please. So I just want to again give you some information. So I, you know, and I'm doing a take a, an intake with a pregnant mom with a substance use disorder. This is largely kind of what presents in front of me. Um, so they have a tremendous amount of issues going on. Typically, honestly, when I open the door and walk in the room, sometimes just the tears start flowing because they didn't plan to be pregnant. So they certainly didn't plan to be pregnant with a substance use disorder, and they're sort of overwhelmed by what's happening. So about 85% of pregnancies of uh, women with substance use disorders are unplanned. Um, in large part, that's because their life is a little chaotic at that time. So they may not actually be seeking care uh, of any kind or they don't have insurance or things like that. The vast majority have had many adverse childhood experiences. So things like substance use in the home, violence, incarceration, divorce, abuse. Um, and we definitely see what's called a dose response relationship. So the higher the ACEs score, the more likely they are to have a substance use disorder. The vast majority have a co-occurring mental health disorder. Um, that can be depression, it can be anxiety, it can be post-traumatic stress, even bipolar disorder. But it's about 85 to 90 percent also have a co-occurring mental health disorder. So that absolutely requires treatment. The vast majority of my moms have more than one substance use disorder. So most of the women I see have an opiate use disorder. Um, so they're addicted to you know, heroin or fentanyl. Um, but the vast majority also have something else going on. It's about 85% smoke cigarettes. Um, we see a lot of cannabis use. So it's about half of my moms are using uh, marijuana or cannabis. We're seeing an increased frequency, just for those of you that aren't familiar with the sort of um, substance use issues across the state, we're seeing a lot more stimulant use disorder than we ever did before. Um, that used to be sort of coke and crack, and now it's really moved into methamphetamine in the last year and a half and pretty dramatically. So we're seeing more of that in our moms as well. As well as alcohol use disorder is certainly, you know, always present, probably the hardest thing to screen for during pregnancy 
pregnancy and certainly the hardest thing to treat in large part because you're not necessarily identi identifying it. Um, again, another really important piece to note is the vast majority of my moms have experienced intimate partner violence either currently or in the past or both. Super important when you're working with these women to make sure that you talk to them alone um, about um, you know, whether they feel safe at home, what's going on at home, um, because oftentimes there's, there's significant issues. Um, and many have you know, difficulty developing healthy attachments with their infants in large part because of what they've experienced in their previous life. Next slide, please. So screening is critical um, and something we're absolutely recommending as part of the Main Mom Initiative. Um, this is the 4P screening instrument, which is recommended by ACOG or the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. It's really easy to use. It's, it helps frame up the questions. I think sometimes people have a hard time asking um, questions about substance use during pregnancy. So this starts a dialogue. It should absolutely be universal, um, not just sort of uh, on a certain population of patients and must be done in private. Um, there's a bunch of risk factors that I list here, but I think it's important to note that people, anyone who's pregnant should absolutely be asked about substance use disorder. Um, you know, doesn't, no matter what their background or their history is, um, it's a very easy questionnaire to ask. Next slide, please. So opiate use disorder during pregnancy, just want to, again, give you a little bit of information about that. Um, we, the opioids basically bind to the receptors in the brain, creating this pleasurable sensation. Women and, and men who are um, becoming um, dependent on opioids tend to use more and more in, to try to sort of get to that place where they were before. Uh, and then if true physical dependence develops and during pregnancy, that, that's a critical issue. So if I'm talking to a mom and I say, what happens when you don't have opioids? Um, and she says, geez, I get really sick. Uh, you know, I, I, I vomit, I have muscle aches, I have insomnia. I'm really, really sick, like a bad case of the flu. It's really important to get her into treatment for her opiate use disorder because the complications to the baby um, are generally around that withdrawal. So when mom is really sick, the, the baby is also really sick. Um, and we see a higher frequency of miscarriages and complications really in the first trimester. Um, and then we see a, a many more complications, particularly in the third trimester. So preterm deliveries, abruptions, things like that, that really can cause significant problems for both mom and baby. Um, opioids are misused in a variety of ways. I think it's important to understand that. Um, intranasal use, intravenous use, um, and inhalation, so smoking the opioids um, is also the ways in which folks use it. Many people use it more than one way, um, but important to just be aware of that. We see a lot more infectious diseases associated with intravenous drug use than we ever did before. Um, about 50% of my moms have hepatitis C, so it's just really important to be aware of that um, and to counsel moms appropriately. For those of you that aren't aware of sort of the, the drug scene in Maine, um, heroin has rapidly become fentanyl, um, so the, and it's now becoming some of the fentanyl analogs like carfentanyl, which just basically means the drugs are getting stronger and people are having more significant um, disease by the time they come in to see me. Um, and you've seen the rates of overdose deaths just skyrocketing, particularly with COVID. Um, and so it's, it's a huge problem that's out there right now. Next slide, please. Um, so another common question I encounter a lot is, you know, why, why do we treat it during pregnancy? And I already mentioned a few of the issues, but opioid agonist therapy, so in other words, using an opioid that binds to the same receptors, which is either buprenorphine, um, or you've probably commonly heard it referred to as Suboxone or Subutex, or Methadone, uh, is absolutely the standard of care. Why do we do this? Um, so if mom's in treatment, she's significantly more likely to actually get prenatal care. So that's a really big thing. Um, we, I'll talk a little bit more about the integrated format that we offer, um, but you know, we see the moms much more when we're providing them with treatment. The goal is to stabilize her withdrawal symptoms um, so she doesn't have any cravings, doesn't have any withdrawal. So a mom that's really stable in treatment um, doesn't think about using drugs and is not in any kind of physical withdrawal. So that's, that's when you know things are going pretty well. Um, we know that untreated substance use disorder is associated with high-risk behaviors. Um, so oftentimes um, women may be engaged in sexual relationships that are not healthy um, because it's a means of obtaining drugs. Um, they may be engaged in illegal behaviors. Um, you know, I have so many patients who say, you know, I can't imagine that I ever would have robbed someone or whatever, um, but the substance use got so bad that they got into situations that um, they never would have thought they would have gotten into before. I already talked about withdrawal causing complications to the fetus. So 
Opioid withdrawal in adults is rarely um, fatal, which is one of the many reasons it's actually hard to get treatment in, con in contrast to things like alcohol use disorder. But again, the fetus can be at significant risk if mom is in withdrawal. So we really try to get her into treatment as quickly and as early as possible. So abstinence is also super unrealistic. I mean, if you have somebody who has a true opioid use disorder, and if you've ever seen them in withdrawal, they are sick. You know, they are just, they have the worst case of the flu you can imagine. Um, and so they don't wanna feel like that, nor can they actually live their life if they're feeling that way. Um, so we just, again, wanna get them on a medication where they feel stable um, and, you know, can, so they can engage in the things that they need to be doing during pregnancy. Next slide, please. So these are your two options during pregnancy. I just want to give you a little bit of information. So methadone has been used longer in pregnant women than buprenorphine, although buprenorphine does seem to have a little bit less strong of an effect on the baby. Um, methadone for the purposes of treatment of opiate use disorder can only be dispensed at federally licensed clinics. Um, so me as a primary care person can't prescribe methadone for opiate use disorder. I can for um, pain, but not for opiate use disorder. So what's important to note about that is the methadone clinics across the state are not, I mean, they're very far apart often. So like I was consulting on a case a couple of weeks ago with a mom that was struggling. We were talking about methadone, but the closest methadone clinic was three hours away. So practically that's just not something that's an option for her. Um, care is often fragmented when women go to methadone clinics in part because again, they're getting their substance use treatment over here and their prenatal care over there. Um, and so it's, there's just different complications there. It's absolutely a good choice for some women, but just to be aware that it's a little bit different. Buprenorphine is dissolved under the tongue. Um, so it's the, in tablet or um, film form, as you can see here. It's inactivated actually if it's swallowed. It can be prescribed by anybody who does an eight hour training um, called the X waiver training. Um, so it does require a little bit more specialty education, but not much. Um, you can use a variety of different options during pregnancy. And one thing that's important to note is the naloxone that's in the, the Suboxone or combination therapy is just put in there to um, reduce the risk of misuse of the medication. So if it's dissolved correctly under the tongue, uh, the women actually doesn't, doesn't absorb really any of it at all. So both options can be used in pregnancy. Next slide, please. So just a little information about Maine Mom. So this is a very exciting grant um, that the state was recently awarded. It's a five-year, $5 million grant um, from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Innovation, CMMI. Um, and so we are developing integrated programs. So what do I mean by integrated? I mean programs where women can come and um, get their substance use treatment and their prenatal care all in one setting. Um, it really reduces barriers in a pretty amazing way um, because again, transportation and childcare issues are huge for this population. The other thing that it really offers, um, and I've been doing it for about 15 years now, uh, is tremendous peer support. So moms have the ability to sort of interact with each other in a way that I never, I never sort of imagined that would happen. And that was not necessarily why we set up the program, but it has really been remarkable in the way they support and care for each other. So the, again, this is just getting off the ground. Um, we have identified these um, care partners. Um, so these are healthcare systems that will be providing this integrated care model. We are the only state that was actually awarded this grant that has partners in all of the state. So uh, there will be programs in all of the 16 counties, which we're really excited about. Um, and the idea is again, to provide better care, uh, quicker access to care to improve outcomes and, and reduce costs. So we really want moms to get into treatment as early as possible and to be aware that there's treatment out there. Next slide, please. So why Maine? Um, and this is a huge issue. I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but we have one of the highest rates of substance exposed pregnancies in the country. Um, we tend to lead um, the nation with uh, Vermont and West Virginia, as you see there. It's about seven to eight percent of all um, infants are born substance exposed in the state. So that works out to be about a thousand ish infants per year. Um, pretty dramatic uh, issue that we really want to make sure again that we treat as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. So what are the key services of the main mom um, program? So we, I've already talked about sort of a group model where um, women come together and get their treatment together. We obviously have to modify that a little bit for COVID. Um, so we're working out those details as well. They'll get access to treatment as part of this group model. We're gonna connect them early on um, with a pediatric provider, um, with all the other social supports that they need. Um, again, these women tend to be 
when they become pregnant, their lives are often in disarray at that point. They're struggling. And so they often have unstable housing or they're living with somebody who's unsafe or they don't have access to food or transportation. So we really want to you know, wrap them up and give them all the services that they need and really try to do it in a, as patient friendly a way as possible, because these women tend to be stressed. They're worried about what's going on. You know, what about this referral to child protective when I'm born or when the baby's born? And so they don't need any other things to be worrying about. So we want to try to make their lives as simple as possible and as um, collaborative, collaborative as possible. We're going to talk to them about contraceptive counseling, but that is, we talk to every pregnant woman about contraceptive counseling. What's your plan for contraception after you deliver? Um, Child-friendly sessions, so play, uh, postpartum that women can bring their babies um, to the group format and um, you know have their babies there um, and learn about how to properly care for their babies. Um, it's a really nice format um, to be able to see moms interact for that length of time with their babies. Um, so safe plan of care is um, what the state is working toward as, um, as part of the substance exposed infant notification rule. Um, so really trying to make it more positive and forward looking and, and feel like, um, you know, this is a, these are the supports in your life and how do we build upon them so we can create the safest environment possible as opposed to sort of a punitive approach, which I really like this movement toward a more positive proactive approach. Um, and then engaging with all these other groups um, to, um, again, provide services to mom. Uh, Kelly's going to talk about Eat Sleep Console. We have some nice uh, evidence-based pain management protocols that are out there, um, as well as access to long-acting reversible contraceptives, which is the standard of care, again, for all pregnant women. So those are um, IUDs, intrauterine devices, or there's an implant you can put in the arm. Next slide, please. Um, so we're enrolling women starting really next July. Um, we're, we're laying the groundwork right now. We have our care delivery partners in place. We really want to make sure women can get into treatment qu quickly. So there's a no wrong door approach. Um, so again, you know, we're aware in some parts of the state that if you identify yourself as pregnant with a substance use disorder, you get an appointment in two or three weeks, um, which is not adequate. Um, we really want moms to be able to get treatment same day if possible. And that may mean in the practices, that may mean collaborating with local agencies. It might mean um, working with emergency departments who are offering rapid access to treatment. So again, trying to sort of make sure that moms get into treatment as quick as possible. Um, a media campaign to direct uh, women to something called Cradle Me, um, which is a state-run agency. One of the things that's challenging is women don't know where to access services um, if they're pregnant and have a substance use disorder. So we really want one phone line, one website where women can go and say, hey, I need access to services. And then Cradle Me can help refer them to the, the closest, most appropriate program for them. Um, and make sure that there's follow-up um, so that women really get into treatment. Sometimes that, that next step doesn't happen. Um, and then simultaneously, we want to make sure that moms who are in treatment through Maine Mom really have one access point where they're getting all their referrals for the social determinants of health. Um, where I've been practicing, you know, for years, we, we have challenges because mom gets referred to three or four different agencies. She doesn't know who's calling her back. She doesn't know what she's supposed to be doing. Um, and so, we, again, we want to make it as smooth as possible. Um, there's this, a large public outreach campaign to reduce stigma, um, to really talk about the fact that um, being in treatment is the standard of care during pregnancy. Um, stigma is huge. Uh, and again, you know, I see moms all the time coming in who, you know, their partner doesn't want them to be in treatment. They think it's safer to be using heroin. They, you know, all these sort of misinformation, um, you know, that baby's going to have problems if they're in treatment. And so it's just, it's really important to, to educate the broader public about what the standard of care is. Um, medication first really is rapid access um, and again getting treatment quickly as possible and then collaborating with these services across the state. Next slide please. Um, the Cradle Me, so this is what I mentioned already, um, that this is um, where folks can access. It's not sort of up and running yet. I mean, we're sort of moving in that direction. We actually don't, well, the Cradle Me exists, but it's not sort of as robust as we want at this point, and it's not necessarily a place where people can go um, to get into treatment. There are programs already providing this service, um, but the goal is really to get them up and running by July of next year. So this is more sort of information about what's coming forward. Next slide, please. And this is the context. If so, if people have questions, Liz Remillard is our program manager. She's phenomenal. Um, I'm the clinical advisor, so I am, you know, coordinating a lot of the education pieces. Um, we're certainly open to having folks who are not 
um, necessarily care delivery partners participate in some of the conversations, learn more about it, um, learn about how you might be able to collaborate with care delivery partners in your community. Um, so you certainly can email either Liz or I with any questions on that. And next slide, please. And this is Kelly. Great, thanks Elaine so much. Um, and I, I just wanted to pause and, and have you start thinking about what are some of the signs and symptoms of uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome. And that's a term we use when um, babies have this constellation of um, symptoms that are usually associated uh, with primarily with opioid withdrawal. Um, so as you're thinking about those, I'm gonna start revealing them. I think most people have heard that these babies cry a lot, um, which is incredibly challenging. Um, that they can be jittery, they have a lot of um, muscle tightness and uh, what we call increased tone. Um, if you picked up one of the babies that's having withdrawal symptoms, some of them really feel um, very stiff um, and certainly not the cuddly, cozy baby that um, we think of and, and people have in mind when they get pregnant. Uh, um, these babies are difficult to feed. Uh, they can be very spitty. Um, their increased muscle tone just makes it hard to hold them and position them and get mom and baby into a comfortable position to be able to feed. Um, these babies can have diarrhea. Um, which means they also are much more prone to diaper rash. Um, and they don't always sleep well. The babies that have, are having more severe withdrawal may only sleep for you know, 20 to 30 minutes at a time. And that adds to the, the challenges for families who have this new baby and the families are sleep deprived and then the baby's adding to that sleep deprivation. Um, so uh, just a reminder too, to be putting things into the chat box um, and happy to answer questions at the end. Um, in the uh, 1980s, Loretta Finnegan, the pediatrician uh, in New York City sat at the bedside of babies who were experiencing heroin withdrawal. Um, and she was really trying to come up with an assessment tool that would be standardized and to help us try and determine what these babies needed. You know, did the babies need a pharmacologic treatment? You know, did they need medications to help calm their withdrawal symptoms? Um, were the symptoms getting worse or they were the same or the symptoms were resolving? And you can see, I know it's, it's very small uh, text, but there's 21 items and the options were a score of anywhere from one to five. Um, and nurses would assess the babies about every three to four hours um, and come up with a total score. Um, and, and so it, it was complicated and time consuming. And for many years, people have been talking about shortening this tool uh, or coming up with a, an easier tool to use. Um, it, it also was really intended for the first couple of weeks of life. Um, you know, the babies sleep, usually sleep a lot in the first couple of weeks. Um, and then after that, have much more periods of awake time. And so part of the assessment tool is assessing the baby's sleep. Um, and as the baby ages, their sleep patterns change um, and the tool wasn't changing with that. Uh, it's also fairly subjective um, in many of the items. In fact, most of the items are very subjective. And so there was a lot of variation between nurses, um, which really, set up a, a dynamic with families and, um, and nurses that wasn't always constructive and helpful. Um, and so in the past probably five years, uh, people at Yale and at Dartmouth and Boston Medical Center started thinking about how can we do a better assessment for these babies? And what really are the key areas that we wanna pay attention to? Um, and over the course of time, uh, it's not as quick as it sounds. Um, I think it was a couple of years in the making. Uh, it, they decided to focus on 
uh, does the baby have withdrawal symptoms? Um, and then is the baby eating? Is the baby sleeping um, for at, um, at least an hour is, is what our goal is. Um, and is the baby consolable? So the baby needs to eat enough to gain weight. The baby needs to sleep enough that um, the family and the baby get rest. Uh, and the baby needs to be consolable. Uh, it would be really difficult to try to bond with a baby who's not consolable. Um, and so this is the tool that was um, and developed and um, refined uh, by Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Um, and it, so it outlines, you know, those specific symptoms of withdrawal that we've already talked about. Um, and then it also hones in on the timing of symptoms. So we know that moms who smoke or maybe on an antidepressant, their babies may have some initial withdrawal symptoms in the first 24 hours that are not tied to withdrawal symptoms from opioid exposure. Uh, and so it, trying to sort that out a little bit. Um, we also know, as I mentioned, that the babies can take, uh, it'd be very difficult to feed. Um, most babies should be able to feed um, within about 10 minutes. Um, and then, as I said, the sleeping for an, uh, an hour or less, and then uh, the consolability. And the consolability, they further broke down into, can the baby console on his or her own? Um, or are they able to be consoled and they can stay consoled for 10 minutes? Or that they, it takes uh, more than 10 minutes to console, or they can't stay at consoled for at least 10 minutes. Um, and then once the nurse does that assessment, um, she really will uh, sit down with the family and talk about the assessment and, um, you know, what's being done to calm the baby. Um, it, what are the things that we can do without moving to medications to help soothe this baby? So if there's a yes on any one of these items, on this ESC tool. Um, the nurse will sit with the family and talk about all those things. Um, if the uh, non-pharmacologic interventions are done and that doesn't help, and the next time the assessment's done, there's still a yes on one of these items, then the nurse will call in the pediatric provider and they'll talk about what are some of the possible causes for the symptoms, are we really maximizing our non-pharmacologic treatments? Um, and is it a, are we at a point in time where we need to help this baby with a, a single dose of morphine or, or other medication? Um, and then there's just an option there for people to document what the management decision is. And so one of the, the other big pieces, important pieces of Eat Sleep Console is that, and the difference from Finnegan is that Finnegan really focused on when do we start pharmacologic treatment? And there was never any clarity or specifics around the non-pharmacologic care interventions. And so Eat Sleep Console really flipped that on its head from that perspective and said, well, let's talk about non-pharmacologic care interventions. Let's make sure we're standardizing these things. Um, and so things like rooming in, making sure that the baby's in the room with mom. And so she's there um, or another caregiver is there ready to respond um, immediately to the baby's uh, stress or hunger cues. Um, that that presence is there to uh, help calm and care for the baby. Um, we do encourage skin to skin uh, when the caregiver is awake and, and feeling alert. Um, and those things, um, if you can think about the, um, in utero, the, the baby's really, you know, in the womb and hearing the mother's heartbeat and all of the, the sounds that are coming uh, associated with mom and her body. And so holding skin to skin is sort of the next best thing. Um, the, the baby can hear the caregiver's heartbeat um, and have that warm skin to skin contact. 
Um, safe and effective swaddling. So um, when we are swaddling babies with blankets, um, we want to make sure that their extremities or their hands are out and that they can reach their face. Um, that there's no extra blankets around the baby's face. Um, and um, again, doing it safely. So if babies are swaddled in the hospital and they try weaning that off as they get closer to going home, because our ideal infant safe sleep is that they go home using a sleep sack um, or, or no blanket, um, just onesie and a, a, a sleeper. The optimal feeding, that it, teaching the infant hunger cues and that they're being fed until they're content, that we do offer them pacifier or a washed or gloved finger for the baby to suck on. Um, keeping the room quiet and low light so the baby's not overstimulated. So I think it always sounds weird to say that the baby's overstimulated, but really um, light and noise, um, people are playing loud music or television can be really distressing to babies and babies will sort of, um, it, it, they'll either cry a lot when they're overstimulated or they may just completely shut down and, and sort of go to sleep. Um, we do encourage this sort of rhythmic moving, movement by the baby, sort of just a gentle um, jiggling, um, it, it, keeping help in the room. So if you're trying to soothe a crying baby and you've just had a baby yourself and you're exhausted, you need some help with that and, and having somebody else available to um, take care of the baby while you take a nap. Uh, we really encourage that. And of course, COVID has thrown a wrench into that a little bit. Um, and certainly the nurses are available and, and using support staff, uh, certified nurses assistants and so forth. Um, again, limiting the number of visitors. So that's been the advantage to COVID is uh, in the hospital, at least there aren't uh, additional visitors other than the, the father of the baby or other support person. Um, the nurses do try to what we call cluster their care. So when they go in to assess the baby and um, how feedings are going, the diaper changes and all of that, they do everything at the same time. Um, we do talk about uh, safe sleep and fall prevention. Um, so if mom's in bed and holding the baby, we want to make sure that she's alert and that she doesn't fall asleep and accidentally drop her baby. Um, and again, the parent or caregiver self-care and rest, um, you know, mom can take a walk or get out of the room or just get a shower even uh, if someone else can help uh, take care of the baby during that time. Uh, so so um, this is sort of what Eat Sleep Console looks like across the state. Uh, all hospitals in the state have had the education and most of the hospitals in the state have implemented this. Um, so if you're working with families um, and you talk about Eat Sleep Console, um, they should be uh, hearing that in the hospital. I, I don't wanna um, bore you with a lot of data, but I think it's really interesting from a public health perspective. And I wanna thank Dr. Alan Piccarillo uh, who manages the data at Maine Medical Center and her, him, uh, his willingness to share these slides. So um, we, the data goes back to January of 2016 when we were doing the traditional Finnegan scoring tool. Um, and we implemented Eat Sleep Console uh, on April 2nd of 2018. Um, and you can see what happened was that we had about 30 to 35% of our babies were receiving some sort of pharmacologic treatment whether they were getting morphine um, or another medication option. Um, as soon as Eat Sleep Console rolled out, you can see that that dropped so that only somewhere between five and 10% of babies are getting pharmacologic treatment. So right there, we're exposing the babies to less medications. We also saw a big decrease in length of stay. Um, the length of stay was between 10 and 12 days on average. 
um, and that has dropped down to more like seven to eight days. And our goal is to work on that a little bit further and get it uh, closer to five to six days if possible. Um, we're also monitoring the breast milk usage and um, for those moms who are stable in treatment, we are absolutely supportive of breastfeeding and encourage breastfeeding. Um, but our breastfeeding rates are only about five, uh, around 50% for the moms who have substance use disorder. Um, so that's uh, an area that uh, we need to continue to work on. Um, this is looking at the number of days that has passed since a baby was transported into Maine Medical Center um, because they had withdrawal symptoms that were severe. So if a baby's in a community hospital and the symptoms are escalating in the past, um, that baby would be transported by ambulance to Maine Medical Center or Eastern Maine Medical Center um, for ongoing care. And so you can see it's been well over a year since the baby's been transported into Maine Medical Center um, for this diagnosis, which is terrific. That's exactly what we wanna see. Um, and then the importance of keeping the families in their community and giving, making sure they have that opportunity to get to know their baby as much as possible before they're discharged home is really key. So the um, hospital also did a survey of their staff before they implemented Eat Sleep Console. And so um, you know, some of the questions were, how comfortable are you in caring for babies with NAS? And the nurses felt very comfortable with that. Um, you will have access to these slides so you can read those. Um, but just one to point out is uh, question eight, how often do you ask parents how their baby is doing to help determine the NAS scores? And prior to Eat Sleep Console, you can see that that didn't really happen a whole lot. And after implementation of Eat Sleep Console, you can see there's a huge increase in that question that, that nurses were really talking more to the families and communicating with them. Um, and the family noticed that. Um, this was just a word cloud created from families who completed a survey about the Eat Sleep Console tool. And, uh, I, I just love this because um, and the families really felt respected um, and thankful. They thought it, the new tool was better. We've had several families who had a baby when uh, the Finnegan scoring tool was being used. Um, and so they were able to assess the old way and the new way and really liked that better and felt that there was much more consistency uh, between the nurses. And so overall, very successful. Um, I know Elaine already mentioned some resources. Cradle Me, the referral system up and running is currently for referrals to public health nursing and Maine families. Um, and I encourage you to refer families to that now and then uh, in the future for uh, substance use treatment and other resources. Um, 211 also has an opiate helpline and um, they have a texting program. You can go on their webpage. Um, Main State Breastfeeding Coalition also is a resource for moms who are breastfeeding. Um, I'll even talk to you about the mom grant. Um, some just visual of uh, some of our national resources. So ASAM, the um, American Society for Addiction Medicine has a national practice guideline and there's a section on pregnancy. Um, they've also released caring for, for patients during COVID-19 and there's a section on pregnancy. Um, the one in the upper right-hand corner, the clinical guidance for treating pregnant and parenting women with opioid use disorder and their babies is from SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Um, and this is uh, the links to all of those. So I think that is it for us. And Heather, do you have any questions coming in? Hi, 
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, um, Elaine and Kelly. We really appreciate it. Um, just a reminder, we do have time for questions. Um, so if you could please enter those in using the ask feature. But I'd love to start out with um, the, the high rates of opioid use in Maine. Could you talk about why that, why the reason is for that or if you have any ideas? Um, so I think it's multifactorial. I mean, I think we don't, we're definitely seeing more um, opiate use disorder sort of across the board. I mean, we have a high rate, so it, it sort of translates into pregnancy. We've seen it escalate in rural areas more than urban areas. Um, you know, I think there's uh, a lot of issues, um, poverty, um, sort of hope that things are going to get better. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, and I think we haven't also, um, We've been kind of behind the eight ball for years um, in terms of also initially we were doing a lot of, um, you know, kind of um, overdose work. So really sort of secondary prevention, people who already had uh, opiate use disorder trying to prevent them from dying. We've really put a tremendous amount of uh, emphasis and investment on um, treatment in the last, you know, several years. So making sure people can get into treatment and access services as quickly as possible. The movement now really is, is more, which I'm super excited about, more toward kind of getting to the kids and some of the work that we've done around making sure, um, for example, kids develop a healthy attachment, particularly like we're doing a big project with our substance exposed infants, making sure that they develop a healthy attachment with their mom, because clearly if they are they feel supported, they feel loved, they feel like mom responds in a positive way, um, they develop a better sense of self-esteem, a better sense of being able to sort of handle challenges and complications, and then really moving that through you know early childhood again identifying kids who might be at risk who are in at risk environments to hopefully just prevent um, substance use going forward so I think there's a lot of efforts I don't think it's particularly well understood there's certainly not one cause I think the other piece you have to keep in mind when you think about pregnant women is you know an increase in the number of pregnant women on MAT is not necessarily bad um, you know in the sense that we want people to be getting treatment um, you know we're finishing up a project um, with some state data looking at you know, the number of women who still aren't in treatment during pregnancy, and it's still a pretty remarkable number. Um, so again, if we see more women you know, in treatment, that's not necessarily bad because the, the evidence is clear that we want them to be getting care. So you have to also read the, the numbers um, with that in mind, but um, it's multifactorial and I think uh, a huge problem, particularly in rural environments. And I, I think I'll just add a couple of pieces to that is, you know, in talking to moms with opiate use disorder, and you talk about their family history, um, often they had at least one parent who had alcohol use disorder. Um, and so they sort of grew up with a parent who was using substances to, to cope. Um, and when opioids became widely available, um, people started using that as a, as a coping tool. Um, it also became very clear very early on that um, these babies had significant withdrawal symptoms. And that's one thing that we don't see with alcohol use disorder during pregnancy. Um, these babies don't, the babies who are alcohol exposed or alcohol affected do not have a specific um, withdrawal syndrome like we see with opiates. And so moms learned quickly um, that they really had to talk to providers and, and talk about being prepared um, and how the baby would be cared for by the pediatric providers and the nurses in the hospital after the baby was born. Thank you. Um, this next question comes from Gabby. She says, such amazing work you're doing, thank you. I'm wondering if you have any idea why the comfort level with the Finnegan questionnaire went down after implementation. Oh, yes, yes, exactly. Um, it, it, the comfort with Finnegan went down because they weren't using Finnegan anymore. And so if the nurses were then asked to use Finnegan, they weren't comfortable with it any longer. Does that make sense? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Um, <laughs> this one's from Jane. She again thanks you for the important work you're doing. And she's wondering, aside from these illegal substances, is anyone counseling newly pregnant moms on antidepressant use during pregnancy? 
Um, I don't know if you can speak more to that. Sure. So I, you know, I think that's a huge issue. Um, you know, we certainly try to very aggressively um, manage it. So it's, as I already mentioned, we see it, you know, at least within the substance use population, a tremendous amount of co-occurring mental health disorders. Um, there's a lot of um, medications that you can use relatively safely during pregnancy. We obviously try to use the safest one. Um, but one of the things that's really critical is that you will oftentimes see a mom relapsing during pregnancy or returning to use, um, again, because her psychiatric symptoms are not well managed. Um, she might be sort of debilitated by her anxiety or, or her depression is just severe and she just will continue to use drugs. And you can sometimes see it's pretty dramatic. You start her on an antidepressant that's pretty quick acting and, um, and and you know, she will ha have a pretty dramatic change. The other thing we've seen, um, which in my population um, is also very important, is that women who are actually, so we looked at women who had you know, the same um, diagnosis. So, um, and those that were on actually antidepressants um, during pregnancy were significantly more likely to still be in treatment uh, six to 12 months postpartum. So I think it both um, stabilizes them during the pregnancy and then frankly stabilizes them um, postpartum as well. Um, and we're aware that these women have a much higher rate of postpartum depression. So even if you don't see it a lot during pregnancy, it tends to really um, come true uh, after the baby's born. So we really closely manage these moms and follow them uh, to make sure that, that they stay safe. Um, so at least within the Substance use population, um, you know, we do I think a, a good job on that and really try to aggressively come manage it. Kelly can probably speak more to the to the other population, but I, I think we're more aware of the impact of um, mental health on pregnancies than we ever were before. And Kelly, you may have more to add to that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I think we're also aware that moms who have depression or um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders is the terminology currently being used. Those moms are at higher rates, uh, at risk for higher rates of poor pregnancy outcomes, preterm birth, um, low birth weight infants. Um, I also want to factor in uh, the severity of the mother's uh, depression and the the, her past history, I and mean, certainly if she's had depression to the point where she's had a prior suicide attempt, absolutely, that, that's not someone we're going to stop their antidepressant therapy for. Um, but it really needs to be a conversation with the mother and her healthcare provider, um, factoring in all those pieces. Great, thank you. Um, and we have lots of questions still coming in. This one is from Kate and she's wondering, how are the hospitals adjusting their space to accommodate the integrated approach being used in mom? Um, so that is a bit of a challenge, particularly in places that don't have a lot of space. Um, you know, I think um, it's a work in progress. I mean, I think that's all I can really say. I think with COVID, you know, we're thinking about how do we, at least within the program that we're building within Maine Medical Center, um, thinking about actually sort of dividing the group in two. Um, so rather than having sort of six to eight women in a room with, with the counselor and the MAT prescriber, um, kind of having the groups be a little shorter, but only three or four women in the room, um, and then sort of alternating so that, you know, half the group would be getting their prenatal care and the other half would be getting their uh, substance use treatment and then sort of flipping them uh, halfway through. So that doesn't require such a large room. Um, you don't really need much in the room. I mean, honestly, I've run groups in, in tiny rooms, um, you know, pre-COVID, obviously, um, but you don't need a lot of space. You just need a, a space where people feel comfortable. I mean, I think that's the biggest piece where it feels private. Um, it feels therapeutic. I mean, oftentimes we'll bring, you know, small amounts of food or something like that um, so that moms just feel comfortable. But you don't really need a lot of space because we don't do a lot of the sort of pregnancy exam piece, at least in the, the group room. Um, we tend to pull them out, although there are models that people actually will do the fetal heart tones and, and the abdominal measurement right in the room. And sometimes they'll put a screen up. So there's lots of different ways to accomplish that, but it, it doesn't require as much space, I think, as one thinks it does. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that the pregnant women or the patients can be in a room because sometimes that's a challenge of healthcare systems. So that's only for staff versus uh, patients. So, um, but it's, we're working on it, but it should not be an insurmountable um, thing for any organization. Um, at all. And there are ways in which you can think about 
doing, um, we're, the goal is really um, co-located care, but one could think about well-coordinated care where say um, the substance use treatment was upstairs um, and they did that and then they kind of came down to the prenatal group, something like that. So there are ways in which you can use space more creatively if you have to. Thank you. That's um, that's great to hear that it won't hopefully take too much of a heavy lift to get the program up and running in hospitals and having them change things around. Um, this next question is from Jenna. She's wondering, have there been any discussions at the administrative level about prevention education for the moms in the mom grant, um, maybe as part of their comprehensive care, its health and system, and how to take an active role in preventing substance use with their own children? I mean, definitely. I mean, this is this is the talk of, of that's happening right now. How do we reduce the next generation of folks with a substance use disorder? And I think that's where a lot of the efforts have gone into really making sure that we're creating healthy children. Um, and and that's what moms desire too. I mean, you know, the program that we started. Um, you know, this group has a tremendous amount of, um, of low self-esteem. Again, the stigma sort of contributed to that. Um, they don't feel that they're very good at anything. Um, you know, there's just a total lack of confidence. So anything that we can give them to make them feel like they are doing things well and, and making, you know, good decisions for their babies. The, one of the reasons I love working with pregnant women and, you know, 90% of my pregnant women go, go home with their mom is that it's such a transformative um, process, you know, that, that this is, I often see people in complete disarray at eight weeks postpart or eight weeks pregnant. And then by the end of the pregnancy, they've made remarkable changes in their lives. And it's, it's to sort of bear witness to that is remarkable. So it, it really is an opportunity for women to make very significant changes in their life. And they want what's best for their baby. I mean, they love that baby with every inch of their soul, just like every other mom who's pregnant. Um, and so they really want to engage in those resources. And I think, again, moving it toward a more proactive approach with the infant safe plan of care, that's like, this is a positive thing. We wanna help support you. We wanna make sure that you're safe at home with your infant. Um, and how do we create the healthiest environment possible? Because again, as Kelly mentioned, we want them to avoid all the adverse childhood experiences. So anything we can do to sort of enhance that bond, um, reduce the risks of um, bad things happening in their home, I think will reduce the, the next generation of folks with substance use disorder. I think another piece of that too is um, you know, reproductive life planning. Um, and Elaine mentioned the availability of long acting reversible contraception. Um, and that's, you know, the mom has had a substance use disorder and she gets stabilized in treatment. And um, how do we keep her healthy and keep her new baby healthy? And um, have her be able to make the choices she wants to make as far as uh, her family and the size of her family and, and when to have another baby. Thank you both. Um, and the, the last question we have up at the moment is again from Kate, would you talk more about babies who are exposed to meth during pregnancy? So are, are you referring, uh, yeah, are you referring to methamphetamine or methadone? That is a good question. I think she's talking about methamphetamines. That would be my guess, yeah. 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 So from a baby care perspective, they would still be cared for under the Eat Sleep Console Assessment and Care Tool. Um, I don't know that there's a ton of research yet on the outcomes of these babies. Um, I, I used to say that it would be similar to babies um, who are exposed to other stimulants. And um, we know from the early 80s, and there was the myth of the, the crack babies and that those babies would be devastated um, intellectually devastated and, and some of those children went on to be straight A students in high school and going to college and, and highly successful. Um, so you know, I was cautious about, you know, talking about long term outcomes until we have the associated data. Um, you know, certainly worry about prematurity and low birth weight um, for those babies as far as birth outcomes and 
Elaine, you want to talk more about what you see from your perspective? Sure. So I think, you know, the, the challenge with meth as it exists right now, um, and, you know, on the ground is that, you know, the, the vast majority of opioids in our community, so the fentanyl that's out there is cut with a stimulant, um, you know, so oftentimes methamphetamine, sometimes cocaine, and sort of the reverse is true too. So when I'm working with a woman who tests positive for meth, I, I first try to figure out, do you even know you're using meth? Um, because that oftentimes they don't. And sometimes we'll actually pick up uh, the stimulant on a drug screen that, you know, we, the fentanyl will be long gone from their system. And they'll be like, I don't do cocaine or I don't do methamphetamine. And actually they're just getting secondarily exposed. Um, so it's important to distinguish, is it sort of secondary exposure from just the opioids you're using or are you actively seeking out meth, which is highly, highly addictive um, and really dangerous. Um, and there is not a lot of good treatment for it. I mean, we, there's no such thing as a suboxone or buprenorphine for meth. My life would be much better if there was. Um, and there are not a lot of good pharmacologic options for treating it. There's some behavioral health options. We're looking at it at the state level, sort of providing guidance around how to take care of people with meth use disorders, thinking about how do we take care of them in the system. Um, like, for example, you know, in an opioid health home, if you only have a meth use disorder, you actually can't get treatment there. So trying to think about how do we deliver those services. From a pregnancy perspective, um, you know, I see it certainly for sure. I would say more often than not, it's actually secondary exposure, not necessarily seeking out the meth. So once we get them into treatment, there's far less exposure. Um, late in term, I mean, the, the thing we really worry about is the um, preterm issues that Kelly mentioned, we do see what's called abruptions, which is um, sort of because of the, the cocaine and, and meth being um, vasoconstrictors, um, you know, they, they really um, can, the, the uterus can basically effectively separate from the placenta because of that lack of, of perfusion. So those are, that's the scary complication when you have a mom who's really bleeding um, from her placenta tearing away from the side of the uterus and she lives in a rural environment, um, that can be a, a, a risk to both mom's life and the baby's life. Um, so that's the, the primary counseling around that is to really um, you know, avoid for that, that purpose is, is a big one. But again, as Kelly said, you know, kids are resilient. I, I, I really think you know, even the babies that I or moms that I see have had significant polysubstance pregnancies. The babies, you know, really do well. We see them into their young childrenhood. Um, and I think the biggest thing we need to be doing is making sure that they're in a safe, healthy, supportive environment. I mean, I think the substances in some ways are, are the lesser issue uh, than whatever they're going home to and the trauma that might be existing there or the ongoing substance use or the violence or whatever all else might be present. I think that's the area we really need to target uh, much more so than the substance use during pregnancy is, is sort of the primary thing to target. We obviously are working on that too. And if someone wants to read more about um, long-term outcomes, is a maternal lifestyle study that was funded by the National Institutes for Health. Um, and they looked at um, pregnancies that were cocaine exposed, opiate exposed, both cocaine and opiate exposed and compared them to non-exposed groups. Um, and really, they found the biggest impact was from uh, maternal education levels and maternal socioeconomic status. Um, I don't want to diminish the um, potential impact of substance exposure, but they really found the biggest impact was from those social determinants of health and not from the substance exposure. Thank you both. And we have just maybe 30 seconds, are you able to touch on a little bit the use of antidepressants and um, the risk for autism? I'm not sure if that's in your wheelhouse. Yeah, I haven't heard that. Um, I'm not aware of any research. I don't know, Elaine, are you? No, and I, I really only know it in the context of substance use, but I, I also have not, um, you know, my bigger fear, frankly, is, is women not being treated for their depression and anxiety during pregnancy for a whole host of reasons, as Kelly already mentioned, the, the issues that are present uh, if, with women who have untreated uh, mental health issues. I have not heard of that link. Um, there's certainly safer antidepressants. There's clearly some that maybe are higher risk in the first trimester sometimes for, um, but again, even those are, there's sort of questions as to how unsafe they are. Um, and again, we wanna manage people uh, effectively. I don't haven't heard about the autism piece, so if that's out there, I don't know anything about it. 
Yeah, I just encourage you to have a conversation with your healthcare provider um, if you're concerned about that. Um, it's anytime we take a medication, we're always thinking about risks and benefits, and um, and the antidepressants are important in preventing some poor health outcomes. Great, thank you both. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions come through, and we are at 11, so we'll have to wrap up this session, but Elaine and Kelly, I wanna thank you so much for being here and presenting this morning and to everyone for their great contributions with the questions. Um, we really appreciate those coming in. Um, just a reminder to please complete your session evaluation and we'll be back in about 10 minutes switching gears and talking for the rest of the afternoon about aging.